Good afternoon, everyone. The City of Casey acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people and pays its respect to elders past and present. On behalf of the City of Casey, I am honoured to welcome you to Bunjil Place to join you for this very special book launch, The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. This very special book commemorates the great men who were awarded the highest honour, the Victoria Cross, for gallantry in the presence of the enemy. I join you here today to honour their legacy, to remember and acknowledge the sacrifice of our fallen soldiers, and we give thanks for their courage, self-sacrifice, and unsurpassed devotion to duty. We pay tribute to all current and former members of the Australian Defence Force, those lost in training, on operation, the wounded, injured and ill. We honour the memory of those gallant men and women who sacrificed their lives in service to our country. Because of their sacrifice, Australia is today a free and safe country. And the many men and women who served in, in the armed forces since have continued this legacy and have defended our nation and values of freedom, independence and equality. It is our duty to continue the defend, to defend democracy and individual freedoms they all bravely fought so hard to protect. I thank you all for your presence this afternoon and hope, like me, you continue to cherish the values of freedom which were defended to the end and which our nation is renowned. In closing, I would like to congratulate Michael Madden and thank him for writing this book to ensure that we will remember them always. Thank you. I met Jack, I, I felt awed in the presence of such a, a man with such a great reputation. I said, this is the great Jack that everybody talks about, whose bravery is a byword amongst diggers. He put him in a straight jacket, so he bit, bit the end of his tongue off. You know, that was the only way he could harm himself. You know, he was so determined to, to, to harm himself, he actually bit the end of his tongue off. Uh, they were out man, out guns. Uh, the other Aussie, Butch Wanton, got hit with machine gun fire. Dash told the rest of them, he could see they were out, outnumbered. He said, I'll stay here with Butch and hold them off, you guys retreat. I think his last words were, you know, my God, somebody help us. It was the initial decision of our dad to go and do what he did. He could have, he could have left Swanton. No one would have begrudged him. That particular battle, I think on the day that 28 uh, Taliban insurgents uh, killed and one Australian soldier. Could have been a lot worse. He showed what he could do in the army. He was killed doing, trying to get the battalion up over a hill. The only thing you get is like a telegraph to say that they've been killed. Came through the post office and delivered to the door. I was in the army, of course. And they said, oh, you've, we wanted you to go home. And as soon as they said that, I, I knew.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Now, is that for a start? I've got my tissues. How are you guys going? <laughs> it's befitting. Thanks, Adrian. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here to share this with us the launch of the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. Today, we are surrounded by people who have supported and assisted our author, Michael Madden, and our team to create something very special. And I hope that you will agree, will agree, when you finally get your hands on the book, that it is truly special. I welcome you here today as the Executive Officer of the TPI Association of Victoria, a position I am extremely proud to hold, and one that has allowed me to represent our members and their families, and indeed the veteran community. I thank the Association for trusting in me to do this. I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of our service and ex-service personnel who are here today and those that have served and continue to serve here and all around the world. I thank them for their service, their sacrifice and their commitment to us as a community that lives in the best country in the world. It's pertinent that we pause for a moment and really think about where we have come from, what has gone before us, where we are now and where we are going where we are going and the impact that our service personnel has had on our way of life. We are truly fortunate. 100 years on since the signing of the Armistice, the campaign in France to end the Great War, and we today reflect on our country's 100 Victoria Cross recipients through this book. Ordinary people who did extraordinary acts. And whilst we acknowledge and honour those 100 men today through this book, we also acknowledge and honour the many tens of thousands of others who have represented and protected our country, who may have been involved in circumstances where their bravery was equally deserving of such an award as the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers is truly a remarkable book. It has brought the person to the centre of the award. It has brought the family of the recipient forward to tell their story. It's about the people and the families told in a unique way. For the TPI Association, the link was obvious right from the start. The synergy that our association has with the stories of many of the Victoria Cross recipients was obvious. And it was our responsibility to support Michael, our author, to tell their stories. You'll find the bravery, the courage, the dedication, the honour and the humility through these stories. And you also find the tragedy, the suffering and the lifelong effects of service in our military through wars and conflicts over the last 130 years. One such tragedy is the story of Martin O'Meara, the 23rd Australian recipient of the Victoria Cross, recognised for his actions at Pozieres in the August of 1916. Just one of the remarkable acts of bravery and one of the most tragic of stories. Martin returned to Australia as a Victoria Cross recipient, was in quarantine on a ship off Fremantle off the Western Australian coast, ready to resume his life at the end of the war. He was there with thousands of others of soldiers when his mental, mental state deteriorated to such an extent that he was put into an asylum in Perth where he stayed for the next 17 years and where at periods of time he spent up to 14 hours a day in a straitjacket. Call it shell shock, call it post-traumatic stress disorder, call it a catastrophic breakdown, call it what you will. He suffered greatly and for the rest of his life before passing away through exhaustion brought on by chronic, chronic mania. A death of one of the nation's most highly decorated soldiers and one that is possibly too horrific to reflect upon in some accounts. I thank everyone who has come along here today and everyone who has supported the production of this magnificent book. I hope you enjoy today and I congratulate everyone involved and thank everybody who has contributed to it. Thank you.
Thank you. You thought I wasn't coming. <laughs> Incidentally, that's not my picture. It doesn't look like me, does it? Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you today as we come together to celebrate the official launch of the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. Now, I won't go into a great amount of detail. There'll be many speakers today. You don't need me to go on for too long. We're surrounded today by some amazing people. And I thank you all for taking the time to come together with the TPI Association of Victoria to discover what has been achieved through the making of this magnificent book. The Totally and Permanently Ex-Servicemen and Women's Association of Victoria, or more easily referred to as TPI Victoria Inc., has a long and proud history of defending and supporting its members, their families and dependents, and in advocating for them to ensure that their sacrifice in the service of our country was recognised and not forgotten, and certainly not taken for granted. Established in 1926, and now 92 years on from its inception, the Association of Victoria is still a very strong collective of individuals and families who combine to support each other and the veteran community. For those that do not know our members, our ex-servicemen and women who through their service have been wounded or injured and now carry the results of this through the rest of their life. They were doing their job, serving and protecting our country, and they, they now pay for that in a myriad of ways forever. So you may now ask yourself, why haven't I heard of the TPI Association? And that is a fair call. It may be that as a membership, we have just got on with the job of supporting each other over the last 90 odd years, and perhaps we have not been as good at promoting ourselves as we should have been. And yes, we are, non, we are a not-for-profit charity organisation that struggles like many others. We have needed to change our approach to survive and we are changing. We need to be there for the past, present and future members and their families, both now and into the future, and we are term, determined to be here. Today is a special occasion, one that sees the work of a small team extended through a much larger team of supporters and contributors that now combines to see the release of this book, The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. The TPI Association of Victoria is proud to have had the opportunity to support the author, Michael Madden, in his endeavours to produce this amazing book. He, along with all who have supported and contributed to its making, should be very proud in what has been achieved. We understand and appreciate what has occurred through the making of this book and with Michael's commitment to return all proceeds from the sale of the book to the TPI Association of Victoria for the support of its members and the veteran community, and we thank him. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the publishers of the book, Denny Neve through Big Sky Publishing, who undertook this project with the commitment to do this at a cost, at cost. This is a commitment that often does not happen these days in business and one that needs to be commended. Thank you, Danny. Ultimately, what Michael and his team have produced and through the excellent production efforts of Danny and his team, we now see a unique and possibly one of the best coffee table books that you could hope to have. For our 100 Victoria Cross recipients, their families and loved ones, we're proud to have supported the project to enable their stories to be told in a uniquely different way. We've been honoured to have had the opportunity to support Michael and the team work with you in telling of your stories. Thank you. In a moment, I'll ask those who are able to stand for the playing of the National Anthem by the Navy Band and sung by Mr Lachlan McLean. Following the National Anthem, please make welcome one our MC for the day, Mr Ross Coulthard. As many will know, Ross is an accomplished investigative journalist and best-selling author. Thank you for attending today. Enjoy this presentation and please consider buying one of the books after the show. You will not be disappointed. Well, I hope you buy more than one book, actually. 
So uh, thank you very much. And uh, that's it for me today. Uh, we'll now have the national anthem. Thank you. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. We've golden soil and land for toil, our home is girt by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare. In history's page, at every stage, advance Australia fair. In joyful strains, then let us sing, advance Australia fair. Thanks, John. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Ross Coulthard. I'm your MC today, and this is a historic day, I think, for more than one reason, not just the launch of this wonderful book. It's a historic day because I think this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the largest, if not the largest, ever gatherings of Victoria Cross recipient families and, and Victoria Cross recipients that's ever been held in Australia. So uh, it's quite a big day. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've, I've got a background as an investigative journalist and the, the way I came into this story and the story of the Victoria Cross winners was because I was involved in the most exciting discovery of my journalistic career, uh, a collection of glass plate photographic negatives that we discovered in a French farmhouse in the Somme Valley uh, about five or six years ago. And they were absolutely wonderful uh, because, I'll just, ah, there we are. They were literally in treasure chests, hidden, hidden in an attic. And uh, in those treasure chests were about 1,000, 1,100 glass plate photographic negatives. And the reason why there's a connection to the Victoria Cross recipients is because Peter Burness, who's the chap on the left there, literally, we'd pulled out all the contents of this attic. We... Uh, we're looking at these images for the first time in a hundred years. And Peter's eyes filled with tears because he held up one glass plate and he said, oh crikey, that, that's Joe Maxwell. And Joe Maxwell was the fellow in this image. He's the chap in the bottom right. And he was one of the Victoria Cross recipients that Michael honors in his wonderful book and Joe's story is just an extraordinary story because it, it arcs the achievement of a Victoria Cross recipient, but it also traces why organisations like TPI Victoria are so important. It, when this photograph was taken, uh, Joe had just earned uh, his Victoria Cross in an action on the Hindenburg Line. Uh, it was the last or one of the last battles of the First World War. And uh, in an act of ridiculous, stunning bravery, uh, eyewitness accounts describe him with his men, all the other officers have been killed or wounded. He literally jumps onto a roll of barbed wire that's blocking them breaching the German lines. He's firing from the hip with his rifle. He manages to incapacitate the machine gunner, then he kills every member of the machine gun that's trying to kill them all. He breaches that line and gets through with his men. But what I find incredible about Joe is that in just over one year of fighting, he earned four decorations for his gallantry. The Distinguished Conduct Medal, two military crosses, and finally, in late 1918, in one of the final battles of the war, the Victoria Cross. His feats are too numerous to detail here, but to give you an example of how extraordinarily courageous he was, his second MC citation is extraordinary. Uh, in August 1918, he again was the only officer left in his company. Everybody else had been killed or wounded. 
He and his men are following a tank up towards the front line. It's knocked out by artillery. They're under heavy fire. Joe's winded himself. His men are all scattered. But he sees that the tank's on fire, and he can hear screaming from inside the tank. He jumps onto the tank, opens the tank, and helps the crew out. Then he has the courage and the strength of mind to then lead his men into battle and win the day. Soldiers like Joe Maxwell were exceptional soldiers, but every soldier who served, as we all know, was brave to even turn up. But it's what happened to Joe and so many veterans after the war that explains why his story has such a strong connection with the work of TPI Victoria. Like so many who served, Joe was damaged by his experiences of war. He struggled with the grog, he found it hold, hard to hold down regular jobs. Heaven forbid, he even became a journalist for a while. And uh, he, he wrote a great book called Hell's Bells and Mademoiselles. When the war ended on Armistice Day, he was in the little town of Vinucor where this photo was taken. And uh, he thought it was all a bit boring, so he literally hitched a rag on a truck and ended up in the Folie Bergère with all the dancing girls in Paris kicking his le legs up on the stage with the naked women on the Folie Berger. Um, he was quite a guy, but when he came back to Australia, he was completely broken, living in a garden shed in the back of a private hospital, never really able to ha hold down much of a job other than being a gardener. And uh, probably these days we'd say he was suffering from PTSD. He once told a relative, don't ever let your son go to war. He also said, if I was the bravest man that day, then God help the man who was the most afraid. He had the courage to admit that whenever he did what he did, he was terrified. As Michael's book reveals, where Joe did find meaning in civilian life was traveling around the country in his Austin A30, checking up on all his old comrades from the battles, only to discover that 19 of them had committed suicide. The death toll after the war was horrific. Men came back broken. They couldn't deal with the cost of war. Uh, these days we call it PTSD, combat stress. There was no understanding of it back then. It was mocked, it was ridiculed. Men were told they were weak if they showed we that, that kind of break in their character. As, as Michael's book details, and as you've heard earlier from Mike Williams, um, there was Martin O'Mara, who earned the Victoria Cross for carrying his comrades and ammunition under shell fire at Pozier, literally dies in a, an insane asylum at Claremont Hospital in Perth. Hugh Throssell, another Victoria Cross recipient, he took his own life in 1933. The lesson from the First World War, which inspired the creation of TPI Victoria, and has inspired what TPI does since every conflict, is that the men and women who serve need to be cared for. They need to be honoured, they need to be remembered, but they need practical help. They need to be looked out for. And that's what TPI Victoria does, and I'm so proud to be associated with an organisation that gives so much love and care to men and women who served. I'm sure Michael has many people who he wishes to acknowledge, but there have been so many contributors to this book from all around Australia and the world, including the families who've perhaps had the first opportunity to tell the stories of their loved ones. That's why it's so special to have all of you here today. And it's also special to have this project and the VC recipients honoured in the magnificent artwork you can see here by my friend and artist colleague, George Petru. George painted many of the Lost Diggers in my book, The Lost Diggers, and he's used his artist's eye to emphasise and extract so much of the, the larrikin attitude, the humour and the pain that you see in these men's eyes. It's a huge thing to write a book like this, and it's an even bigger undertaking to write a book that requires travel all over the world, honouring something so sacred as our nation's warriors. But I know Michael and Gordon Trail will want to especially acknowledge and welcome the many members of Australia's 100 VC recipient families who've travelled from all around Australia and the world to be here today, a gathering that has never happened before and is a truly unique one. 
I don't think Doug or any of the families, or Keith or any of the families here, would disagree that there are so many actions that have been done by our service men and women over the years that did not attract a Victoria Cross, but were just as worthy. There's a guy I wrote a book about called Charles Bean. He was the official historian in the First World War. And he often lamented that the bravest of the brave were those who'd fought to the death unseen and now lay in a muddy ditch, unacknowledged. But by honouring those who were recorded, who were witnessed, we honour all of those even more. So what I'd like to do particularly is acknowledge the awesome generosity of Danny Neve of Big Sky Publishing, the boss of Big Sky Publishing that made this venture po possible. I was hoping to get you up on the stage, Danny, and I understand you're somewhere here in the audience, but could we give a big hand of applause to Danny Neve? There's a very special guest we've got now. Um, Mike Brady is, of course, a singer who's synonymous with Australian sporting anthems, but today you're going to hear a, a very different side to his work. I'll, I'll let him sing his beautiful songs, but uh, you should know that his father, Bob Brady, served in the Royal Leicestershire Regiment, uh, an Irishman serving in a British regiment in World War II. And uh, I was told by Mike that his father landed at D-Day on around about the second or the third day of D-Day. But like so many of these men, he never got over it. Please welcome Mike Brady. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Ross. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've got the great pleasure on Wednesday of being invited to the MCG to sing on Anzac Day. And I can assure you I'm not singing up there, Kazali, <laughs> or one day in September. But um, I've written a song and I dedicate it really to all our service people, past and present. And there's a lot of them and the song is my tribute to them and to the RSL and what the RSL was built for. It was probably the first men's shed, but, uh, and we know what good that has done. So I'm, I'm, I'm filling in time while I get my words. So this is the first time I've sung it publicly, so uh, bear with me just a little bit. It's called This Place. We built this place that they might come to share a yarn or two And remember fallen comrades, these Aussies tried and true That they had seen and done so much that only they could know They gathered to remember and they put their hearts on show we built this place that they might come to share with one another. These heroes of Australia, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers. For their mates in king and country, they had answered the call. This place was their place to share both one and all. memories and the times to stand to and remember those they left behind and they still stand together to help each other This place is their place And it's what we're still about We 
built this place that they might share the things that they had seen of life and death and meaning and the moments in between to lift the spirit here and there to let the demons go to remember and share the pain that only they could know this place is their place the memories and the times to stand to and remember those they left behind and they still stand together they've come here through the years this place is their place for their laughter and their tears this place is their place the memories and the times to stand to and remember those they left At the end of every day This place is their place And it's why we're here today mm -hmm. This place is their place And it's why we're here today Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Ross mentioned, uh, my dad was an old soldier and I knew nothing about him until my son, who's 23, has just finished writing a book where he researched it forensically about my father's service. And all I knew was he was an old soldier and he had lots of problems. He died very young. Now, I've written this song as a tribute. I've never sung it before and I thought I'd preview it uh, with you today and I hope you enjoy it um, and I'm sure some of you will relate to it. I spent 10 months of my life in Vietnam working with the American troops over there as an entertainer and I saw what the, uh, what the effects of men in combat can be and women um, and I guess it's really about the things I didn't know about my dad. There was a man I hardly knew He made our mum his wife He didn't give a lot away About his troubled life We had a clash of reason Ideologies and the like Two speeding locomotives One named Bob, one named Mike See, Bob was an old soldier Who'd seen more than his share Of what a human being Should ever have to bear And Mike was full of youthful fire Just living in the now So it came as no surprise at all There'd be some mighty row Life is full of mysteries And to TV my dad was one he wore the scars of battle, knew the tyranny of gun. I knew nothing till just recently of this Irish soldier lad, till my youngest son stood up and introduced me to my dad. He's been gone nearly 50 years, like he's come back from the dead. My son had found the story what was happening in his head. It was like hope had lost its meaning somewhere out there in the grime. And like so many 
Before and after him, the scars didn't heal with time We didn't see each other much, but we finally made up And just a few days later, he took his last sip from life's cup Find my cup. I'd know nothing till just recently of this Irish soldier lad till my youngest wrote a book and introduced me to my dad. I knew nothing till just recently of this Irish soldier lad till my youngest wrote a book and introduced me to my dad. Thank you very much. Please enjoy this week. And uh, lest we forget, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Good on you. Wasn't that great? The next bloke I'm about to introduce to you, I just love working with him. He's a, he's a larrikin, he's a comedian, but he's also one of the bravest men I've ever had the, the good fortune to meet. I'm talking, of course, about Keith Payne, VC, AM, KSJ. Please welcome Keith Payne, VC. <laughs> you have a seat, have a seat there, uh, Keith, and I'll come and talk to you. While Keith's getting settled, I'm just going to give you a, an account, an abridged version of Keith's citation for his Victoria Cross. In May 1969 in South Vietnam, Keith's commanding a company of Australian soldiers when it's attacked... Uh, Australia, sorry, not... Uh, it's Vietnamese soldiers, wasn't it, Keith? They were Vietnamese soldiers, weren't they, Keith? Hello. Were they... <laughs> Were they Vietnamese soldiers you were in command of, Keith? The yeah, they were indigenous soldiers, uh, Montagnard soldiers uh, from the hills, uh, from, uh, covering a whole lot of that area that we operated in. Right. His company was isolated and surrounded on three sides, and Keith's Vietnamese troops began to fall back. He was now wounded in the hands, arms, and under heavy fire, he covered the withdrawal by throwing grenades and firing his own weapon. Keith organised the remnants of his company and a second one into a defensive perimeter by nightfall. But it's what he did next that takes my breath away. He then spent three hours scouting for isolated and wounded soldiers as the enemy kept up fire. He found 40 wounded men and brought them in only to find that the remainder of his battalion had moved back. He then led the group back through enemy-dominated dominated terrain. Keith, how did you do that? What, what were you thinking? Were you scared at the time? No, uh, Ross, I, I, all I was considering was the fact that uh, I was the company commander and it was my responsibility to look after my soldiers, which is a normal thing within the military. So uh, I wasn't going to about ask somebody else to do a job that I wasn't going to do myself. So I, I, it's my responsibility, accept the responsibility. Did you think you were going to get out alive? Did you think you were going to survive that night? Oh, no, I said goodbye to my family at one time. <laughs> Keith's wife, Flo, is in the audience here, and I'm sure she's very grateful he came back. The thing that really strikes me, though, Keith, is that you're a man of good humour. How do you keep your sense of humour when you have that memory of what you went through? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Now, uh, I... After it was all over, and, I, and somebody spoke about post-traumatic stress before, well, I suffered post-traumatic stress. Once I started to get over it, and you never get rid of it, but uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to live, I'm going to live a happy life. Uh, and 
the only my only big problem, of course, is see, you may can't some of you can't see, but I got stitches on my face here at the moment. Right, that's only because the girls instead of kissing me, they bite me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I just live life. Right. So listen, uh, that's Keith Payne. <laughs> Stay there, Keith. I want to welcome now to the stage Doug Baird, who's the father, the proud father, of Corporal Cameron Stewart Baird, VCMG, another brave Australian who sadly gave his life for his country in Afghanistan. Welcome, Doug Baird. <laughs> hey, Doug, if you have a seat next to uh, Keith. While Doug's getting settled, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, Cameron's citation. In June 2013, he was a commando platoon of the Special Operations Task Group, Operation Slipper. With the assistance of the Afghan National Security Forces, they're conducting a helicopter assault into Gorchak village in Uzgan province in Afghanistan. They attack an insurgent network within enemy-held territory. Corporal Baird's team is engaged by small arms fire from several enemy positions. He leads his team to neutralise those positions, killing six enemy. An adjacent team comes under enemy fire with its commander being seriously wounded. Corporal Baird immediately leads his team to provide support. His team is then engaged by rifle and machine gun fire from prepared positions and the flank. He neutralises this threat. On three separate occasions, Corporal Baird then charged the enemy-held building within the compound. In the third attempt, the enemy was neutralised, the advantage was regained, but Corporal Baird was killed in the attempt. Doug, I, I can't begin to express from all of us the the, the warmth and the, the spirit that we all feel towards you about losing your son in Afghanistan. But I can imagine that, quite rightly, you are an incredibly proud father. What are the qualities that Cam expressed that you admire the most, though? Uh, look, Ross, uh, we, we feel extremely humbled uh, by the whole lot. Um, Cameron spoke about what it was meant to be part of a team um, and I think as Keith alluded to early uh, he was the boss he was responsible uh, for his men Cameron was exactly the same and that particular day that uh, he lost his life um, it was a very dire situation uh, they'd been fighting uh, for many hours they were running out of ammunition uh, another team commander was down and they had to get that helicopter in to get him out to save his life or save his leg so Cameron was in a position where he had to do something and uh, rather than ask somebody else to do it, he decided he would do it himself. And at the end of the, the day, he lost his life, but uh, he lost his life doing something that he loved, something he believed in. And uh, I think probably from a parent's point of view, it's not how things should be. A father or a mother should die before you, you lose your son or your daughter. But uh, it, it is what it is, and uh, we have accepted it, and we know now that Cameron won't be walking through the door. So, Doug, I can imagine that for a grieving parent, it would be very easy just to shut the door and just sit in a dark room and just try and bury yourself. But you have thrown your life, you and your lovely wife, have thrown your lives into helping vets, speaking to schools, You've created a, a, a special uh, association that, that CAMS cause. Tell us a little bit about that. What's, what's motivating you? What are you trying to do? Uh, look, Ross, really right from the very start there, um, what we wanted to do as parents, and I think we probably demonstrated the day that uh, Quentin Bryce presented the Victoria Cross to us, and uh, we were told basically we had a line that we couldn't go past, uh, but we were determined to acknowledge the commandos in the room. And we went forward and we acknowledged them because we believe that's what Cameron w would want us to do. And we also believe too that Cameron done a lot of charity work and he, he would want us to continue that 
and, and part of that is Cam's cause. We're very fortunate we have uh, a group of four people um, that do an absolute outstanding job and do not take one red cent. For every dollar we raise, uh, it goes directly into two commando regiment uh, and we do support the Commando Welfare Trust. We also support other charities, but that's the basis and we believe that by doing that, it allows us to uh, carry on what we believe Cameron would be doing for his fellow soldiers. And I might ask both of you gentlemen, you first, Doug, what, what does this book mean to you? How important is it for you and for the, the families of VC recipients to see Look, a book like this? Ross, that is a fantastic question. And I think from my perspective is that it gives, we have number one, Victoria Cross at the very top up there. We have the 100th on the other end down there and we have 98 in between. This book's given the opportunity for everyone, every member of the family an opportunity to, to tell a story, to tell about uh, what their family member did do. And I think probably I'm in this particular group, I'm the only father. Most are either daughters, brothers, or probably less or so, but the Victoria Cross to us and the book itself is an opportunity to be able to continue to tell the story and we no longer concentrate on Cameron, we concentrate a lot about the regiment. Two Commando Regiment is the highest decorated regiment in our army over the last uh, 10 years. They've had the loss uh, of 13 killed in action and over the 60, 65 year period of the commandos they do not have one Victoria Cross now they do through Cameron, so we, we think that's about as good as what it can get. Keith, uh, Doug used the word family when he was describing the families of Victoria Cross recipients. There's an enormous number of people here in the room who are family associated with Victoria Cross recipients. How important is it for you to bond with other Victoria Cross recipient families? How important is it to share your story? Uh, look, the easiest thing that uh, I find with the whole thing uh, is bonding with a family. And uh, uh, before I go any further, welcome to the VC family that is here today. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it has come to my mind just a, a, a couple of weeks ago that uh, when, uh, well, it's more than a couple of weeks, we were unveiling the uh, statue of uh, Reg Ratty VC uh, and I, I spoke to Rob, uh, Robert, his uh, eldest son and I said you know I think you should start a VC family association to keep the family together and uh, Rob volunteered, you know how you volunteer for yeah. things? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob volunteered to be the interim president uh, to get the family together. So, uh, family members that you're here today, uh, please get in touch with Rob and uh, he'll, through his own little work, will get in touch with uh, the family members so that you do start in a family, uh, family association and that bond, that bond will last forever. And thank you for that, Keith. The, the Victoria Cross Family Association, Australia, New Zealand, I was very privileged last year to be in Nowra, and um, the idea of the association was conceived there with Keith and Doug, and I think Willie Appiata from New Zealand as well. And it's, um, it's got a sister association in the United Kingdom with the Victoria Cross Family Association that was set up under the Victoria Cross Trust in conjunction with Ashworth Barracks in Doncaster in the UK. So uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to bring all of you families together and share your stories. 
I'd now like to introduce the hero of the story, the, the author of the book, Michael Madden. Oh, uh. Good luck, Michael. Thank you. Uh, oh, what a day. Um, sorry, I just got to make sure I'm working here. There we go. Right, today, um, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, it, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to all the families that are here that I've gotten to know. Um, today is a, uh, a very special day. It's more than a book launch. Today is a day of remembrance. It's a day of recognising the service uh, and, uh, of many through the, the gallant actions of a few. And also it's a day to acknowledge the families uh, and all the many connections that the Victoria Cross gives us. One thing we learned through the producing of this book is that the Victoria Cross is in an odd way a kind of holistic thing. Um, Gordo and I, we had a, something that we called our one degree of separation. I think six degrees, everybody knows Kevin Bacon. Well, with the VC, it seems to be, it seems to be just one degree. Um, everybody it connected in weird and, and wonderful ways, and, and that's what today's all about. This has happened to me before. I hope it doesn't happen again. There we go. Okay, um, obviously I have a lot of people to thank. Th this project is, is much bigger than me. This, what you're looking at here, this is the acknowledgements pages at the back of the book. I can't possibly stand here and thank you all. Most of you are here today. Um, I think there's 200 and something names up there. And uh, some of them are RSLs that they represent huge groups of people. But there is uh, a few people who are more central to the core of the, the project, who I'd like to introduce onto stage now. Uh, these three blokes, um, I, don't, I don't think this would have ever happened uh, without them. Um, so if you could please welcome uh, Gordon Trail, the book's photographer. Uh, George Petru, the wonderful artist. And of course, Michael, Michael Williams from the uh, TPI Association. Without Michael, this wouldn't have happened. Now, th th this book is probably, in my mind, uh, it has three different parts. It's, it's, it's about the writing, it's about the images, and it's about the artwork. And, and George uh, came in, was a big part of that. Um, and you'll see his art through the book. There we go. Okay, so the idea of the book, um, well, the project started in 2014, so it's been about, about four years. The idea was to, to photograph every set of medals, every grave, every statue or monument for Victoria Cross recipients we could find anywhere on the planet. We found all 96 graves, we photographed all of them. Some of the, 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 the places that uh, these guys are buried are Russia, Kenya, Libya, Egypt. Uh, it just gives you an idea of how scattered they are um, and it gives you an idea of the breadth of service this country uh, has given over the years. Part of, the, part of the program as well was to try and interview as many family members as I could. Um, I didn't want this to be sort of a, a boring bullet point book about history. I wanted to involve the people behind the men. Uh, and I thought if I could find 15 to 20 families, that would be an extraordinary effort. Um, it had never been done before. There's no register anywhere of uh, Victoria Cross families of who they are and where they are. And, and so I thought if I could get 20, um, that would be extraordinary. Uh, we ended up with, with about 60, which um, from the 100 men exceeded our expectations. Um, and I loved, I loved every one of them. 
in my mind, uh, this book had to be not not for profit. It um, it didn't sit didn't sit well to have anybody making money out of it. Uh, for me and my family, that was um, in a case of basically picking a charity. Uh, for us, TPI was was a simple one. Uh, TPI Association have been extraordinary for Dad and for my family, uh, even recently. And we had a bit of a scare with the old man a couple of months ago. I was a bit pissed off at him, actually, because I went and did all this to help him get this association, keep it running, and he nearly died on us. So it was very inconsiderate, I thought. But, um, <laughs> but again, through that, TPI rose to the, to the top and, and did everything they could to support and were effective again. And, and their support continues. So I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about the things that we saw um, on this journey. Uh, we came across all different types of memorabilia, uh, you know, dog tags and rank pips and medals and lost bits and pieces and guns and all these incredible things. But one thing I want to talk about, what I saw, um, which, which meant the most to me, if it wakes up, is that... That's my family, part of it. Um, and I saw that reflected in so many of the families that I got to know and that I spoke to over the years. Um, apologies to Steve down here at the front. I think he's here today. Sorry, mate. But uh, this photo was taken um, on the farm I grew up in, grew up on years ago. And if you want to know where my, red hair come, uh, my daughter's red hair comes from, that's me at the back with the arrow sticking out of his head. And that was the big part, and that's the thing which, which gave the book its point of difference. Uh, it was the families, and they are families like any other, just like mine, and uh, it, that's something I'll never forget. So this might, uh, might, might prompt you to ask, why? Why do this? Why the Victoria Cross? What's so special about it? Well, the Victoria Cross, as I think we've, we've touched on, is the highest award for valour on earth. Only 100 Australians have ever received this award. We have one sitting here with us today, which is a huge honour. Uh, and to give you an idea of what a big deal the VC is, when you are awarded a VC, you get the post nominals VC after your name. No matter what else you achieve in your life, if you're knighted, PhDs, Nobel Prizes, Nobel Laureates, nothing comes before VC. It is always first. And that applies to the order of where you'll notice Keith and, and Doug with their medals on there. Uh, the VC is on the far left and it works its way down. Nothing comes before VC. The story behind the VC itself is, is a pretty remarkable one. It was introduced by Queen Victoria uh, during the Crimean War, uh, when the, the, the English and the French were fighting together against the Russians. Now, the English noticed that the French were handing out this medal here, back there. They clearly don't know what I'm doing. But that is, that is the Legion of Honour. Uh, you've probably all heard about that. That can be awarded to men and women of any rank for any, any reason. It is their highest award. And at this time, uh, we, we, the world had was introducing uh, journalists and reporters to, to the war, to the, to the front lines, and they were reporting back home in the papers. And for the first time, people were reading about the actions of their neighbours and their families. And in a lot of cases, if you were not an officer, you could only receive a mention in dispatches or uh, perhaps a promotion if you were lucky, but even these things were very rare. So. Uh, they thought about coming up with uh, a new award uh, that could be awarded to everybody. Uh, they brought the idea to Queen Victoria and she absolutely loved it. She threw her weight behind the, the creation of the award, the award. Uh, even stepping in at one stage during the awards, the awards um, development where they were going to have the words not, uh, sorry, for the brave on the lot across the bottom of the award. She changed that to for valour because she thought 
for the brave suggested that the only brave men in her forces were the men who had this award and she thought all her men were brave. What you're looking at there, that is Queen Victoria's personal diaries. Now, you can't read these in, in Australia, they're not published here. They've only just been published uh, overseas, you have to be in um, the United Kingdom to read them. We were given permission by, by the current Queen to use this in the book, nobody knows about this yet. Um, there's a few excerpts from that, uh, it's an interesting story when we were over there um, filming and, and shooting. Uh, they sort of dropped this on us, um, that you can do it, but you have to do it before you leave. So it was a matter of getting back to the hotel room, reading through decades and decades of this woman's writing to try and find any links to the Victoria Cross. So um, the days and nights got very long, but um, it, I learned a lot from going through that. And the main thing I learned is how much she cared about her men, her, her, her sailors and her soldiers. She wrote about them every day. She met them every day. These were not decorated men, men who had been injured and wounded. She remembered where they were from and she wrote about them in her diaries. And you have to remember, this is her personal diaries. She didn't know anybody would ever read this, so there's no pretense involved here. So Queen Victoria clearly was just the right person in the right place at the right time to take this project on. And it's when, you, when you see the book, it will be unveiled soon. That's, that's the cover on the left. Um, some of the writing you see here along the spine and down the, the edges here, that's actual photos of Queen Victoria's writing um, from some days I found where she did talk about the Victoria Cross and in particular the day that she first handed it out at Hyde Park. It's one of many little surprises in the book. This is a little jeweller's called Hancock's in London. Uh, when they came up with the idea of the Victoria Cross, they thought that um, it, it should be very, a very humble and simple award and they had to find a jeweller to take on the job. At this stage, Hancock's had only been around for seven years. They were silver workers. This shop is still in London, in a little arcade there. It's still there today, it hasn't changed. Uh, they have made every single Victoria Cross ever, ever made. Um, and we went there and we got in downstairs into the vault and um, we spoke to them and, and it, was, it was quite amazing. And the idea for, uh, for creating the Victoria Cross, one of the ideas they had was to make it from cannon. Um, legend tells us that the Victoria Cross is made from Russian cannons captured at the Battle of Sebastopol where they've been melted down. Um, it's a nice story but it's not true, unfortunately. Um, there the cannons there, you can see they have not been melted down and they're also not Russian, they're Chinese, so like everything else these days, <laughs> the VC's made in China. And what they did is they took this part here, this is the castor bell, okay, so this is the part where they secure ropes to the back of the cannon to control the, the massively violent recoil. They took that off and they that's what's left of it there, it came off this cannon up here, and they slice a little bit off um, and they make 12 at a time and, and that's all it is. That's not been melted down, that's simply the castor bell off the back and that's all that's left of that. But don't panic, there's two full cannons there that they can go on to if they want to. Now that piece of metal there um, is kept at a military base uh, in Shropshire in the United Kingdom. It's a very high security, security base, it's where they keep all their weapons um, and within that base there is a vault, within that vault there is a safe, within that safe there is a box with a padlock on it and inside that box is that metal. The security of that vault is second only to nuclear warheads. They take this very, very, very seriously. They do not muck around. Uh, Gordo and I, we were the first Australians ever into the vault um, to get our hands on it and, and photograph it for the book which was a huge honour and we were also invited to Windsor Castle by Her Majesty where we got to hold the, the replica Victoria Cross which was made for Queen Victoria by Hancock's um, which the royal family still has. Uh, it's one of the most prized possessions so um, we did all right didn't we mate? That's the, the prototype on the left. 
um, that was sent to Queen Victoria in uh, 1854. That's a real Victoria Cross on the right, I think. Um, out of interest, I believe that's Martin O'Meara's. Uh, she loved it as soon as she saw it. The only changes she made was to add some laurel leaves along the bar here, and she put a little V underneath. Um, I'm not clear if that's for Victoria or Valor. I, I think it's for Victoria. Keith might know. That's about it. She, she um, and to, to make sure that it was bronze, not copper, which that one was, which they were already doing. Over the years, the Victoria Cross has changed quite a bit. The way they make it, um, because it's made from recycled bronze that's melted down, it's very, very hard. And Hancock's had all sorts of problems. Their dyes kept cracking. So they had to sand cast these, these metals. Uh, and then they have to hand chase them, hand finish them. So they're all a little bit different. And they're, they're issued in, well, created in lots of 12, where they slice that little piece off the, the castor bell. So it can, decades can pass between, between making them. You can see on the left, these are two real ones. You see the, the mane there compared to the mane on the right. Very, very different. Even the crown is completely different. You've got the little dots there and lines. Um, and these were probably made uh, decades apart. So they are all a little bit different. On the back, uh, Hancock's inscribed some secret marks and codes, uh, which are recorded in uh, a book called the Victoria Cross Record. Uh, and those identifying marks are kept under high security. Again, we got to hold that book and have a look through it. And what they do if one of these awards ever goes up for auction or is stolen or needed to be, need to be identified, Hancock's go out with that book and they have a look at the back of the VC and they check the little marks and make sure it, it is the right one. The medals on the left, the one at the top there, that's the Victoria Cross of Sir Neville House, our very first Victoria Cross recipient. Um, below, these are Cameron Beds. Um, in, uh, both of these medals, uh, sets of medals are in the War Memorial today and, and obviously featured in the book. Uh, we, we went to the Western Front as well as many other places uh, making this, this book. Um, and that was an, ex an extraordinary journey. We, we visited 22 sites in three days. Um, and if anyone's been to the Western Front, they can understand what that might have been like. Uh, we... Um, we were obviously pressed for time and money. And when I say 22 sites, I don't mean 22 graves, I mean 22 individual sites. Um, it was go, go, go the whole time. Um, but it was an incredible experience. Um, that's polygon wood on the right, incidentally. Um, that's where my great-grandfather was shot. Uh, now, the wives of TPI veterans, um, my mother and her friend Nola Campisi, uh, handmade some, some poppies and uh, as a thank you from the families or the wives of TPI veterans, we laid those poppies on every grave on the Western Front to thank the families for their involvement in the book and we did a live broadcast as we were laying them, um, laying them down so the families back home um, could see what we were doing um, and, and watch live as we laid them. Uh, oh yeah, and we had a smell checker too, just to make sure, that's my daughter Madison, um, just to make sure that they were up to, up to speed and I think she was pretty happy with them. So. Uh, we also carried a, a repli Victor replica Victoria Cross around with us, which you'll see featured throughout the book. Um, we put that on most of the graves to photograph it. Um, when I say replica, it's actually made by Hancock's um, it, for all intents and purposes. It's a real Victoria Cross. Um, we took around and um, I was supposed to bring it today but I forgot so um, but you have a real one here so you don't need it so that, that's basically what we got up to during the making of the book um, as I said earlier it's important to stress that this book is is totally not for profit I'm not taking any money from this and neither is the publisher so all the money that we take from the sale of this book goes directly to TPI Victoria um, to help people like my dad and families like mine and so many others. Uh, so I encourage you all to buy a book if you can. Um, we've been, been told that we should have charged a lot more for it, but that's okay, I think 80 bucks is good. Um, there, is, there is a limited edition $180 version as well, which is probably a little bit more online for what it, it should be, uh, is 
probably should be priced at. Um, so if you can afford it, again, all that money goes directly into TPI, so please, if you can. There's only 400 of them, and I think most of them are gone. Um, so if you can afford it, please grab one of them. So once again, thank you all for coming and for having me, and uh, unless we forget, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Michael. I, I take my hat off to Michael. To turn out a book of that quality in such a short period of time is just extraordinary. I, I saw my copy for the first time last night and I was transfixed. It's an amazing read. I'd now like you to welcome the son of the man who earned the medals sitting on that pillow over there. Uh, the Victoria Cross recipient whose medals are sitting there was Reg Ratty, VC, who earned his Victoria Cross on Bougainville uh, during World War II. And I'd like you now to welcome his son, Rob Ratty. <laughs> hey, Rob, have a seat here. Can, I, uh, can we get a microphone, perhaps, please? Thank you. Ah, thanks very much, Doug. Good old Doug. He's Always organised. Is it on, mate? Yes. Yeah. So, <coughs> Bob, I'm, um, I'm fascinated with your dad's story. I've read a little bit about it, but just give the audience uh, a sample of uh, what your father did to earn his Victoria Cross. Right. I usually say to people, um, Google it, <laughs> read the citation yourself, because um, I don't do it justice. But it sort of happened like this. Now, his unit was pinned down on what it was, the Bruin Road, leading up to Sl Slater's Knoll was the place on Bougainville. Um, like, his officer had been killed. He was a sergeant, so he took over, like these fellas, you know. Next chain of command, uh, these are my boys. I've got to look after them. So after two of his mates right next to him being shot, um, the story goes he went off like a box of firecrackers, grabbed his Bren gun, shooting from the hip, and single-handedly charged the um, bunker. Um, threw grenades, took out that bunker. Then he was out of grenades, so he rushed back, got some more, decided to take on the next one. So, um, you know, luck. After, when he'd been interviewed, he said, oh, I was very lucky. Um, he come home and give his mother a... His mother was watch, washing one of his shirts and the tail had been blown off it. She said, oh, he said, I had a bit of a run-in with the nips and that's what happened. Um, you know, and then later on in the day he did the same thing, he took out a heavy machine gun and they you know, got 500 rounds or something and the crew fled after he uh, attacked that. But um, like you said, you know, there's boys doing the same thing up here every day of the week and got not getting recognised. He said, I was just one of the lucky ones. You were born obviously well after the war, did he ever talk about it? No, this is what I'm saying. You know, I've told Michael a few stories. They only talk about the funny things that happen up there, none of the serious stuff. Um, yeah, so if you read the book, Michael's got a couple of stories in there that'll make you laugh. Um, I won't tell you today because I'll spoil it. Uh, <laughs> is it true your old man kept his uh, medals in his glove box? No, in, his, in a biscuit tin in his, shoe drawer, in his sock drawer. So, Th um, these are medals, by the way, that are probably worth... We've got a security guard behind the stage here today because the medals are probably worth... What, what would you reckon, Mike? Wouldn't he between $1.2, $1.5 million? Yeah, I mean, they're extraordinary, these medals, and it's extraordinary to me that he was so cavalier about them. <laughs> but like you say, you know, they're worth nothing to us because they'll never get sold. Um, it was <laughs> in his will that they'd be passed down through the family, so that's how it's going to be. And so do you guys, if you've got another brother, do you have to fight him for it? No, I've only got sisters, mate, so I'm lucky. <laughs> <coughs> so I'd like you to meet the uh, artist George Petru, my dear friend George. Oh, I met George, yeah. Oh, I ha have had the pleasure of meeting George. I'm going to let George drive things from here. We've got a bit of a surprise for you. You have? Oh, great. What's happening here? We've got to un unveil a painting. Can you see it? Yeah. Two, 
Fantastic, mate. What do you reckon? Has he, has he captured him, mate? Well, there's a photo in the War Memorial in Canberra, the sternest looking Reggie Rady you've ever seen. Um, everyone knew him with a smile on his face, and this is how he was. Easy going, happy fella. George, you've captured it down to a T, mate. Thank you. I'll just take that off you. So, <clears throat> I'll, get, I'll get you to sit down, George, and if you could just maybe stand across there a little bit. Uh, I'm going to introduce another very proud son of a, a Victoria Cross recipient. I, I'd like you to meet George Wheatley, who's the son of uh, Dasher Wheatley. If you could come in now, George. Thank you. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. So, George, I want you to look up at this beautiful little boy here yes. and this ugly bugger here. So, oh. <laughs> uh, My mum's up there. <laughs> that's you, isn't it? Yes, I was 13. Um, that's Lord Casey. And that's um, ended up being a friend of our family in the background. It's Lieutenant Colonel Russell McNamara, who was in charge of the um, training camp in Vietnam when Dad was there at that stage. You're a very proud boy there, aren't you? Yes, yes I was. It was, um, it had been gone, Dad got killed in 65 and it took 13 months for the medal to come through. Of course, a bit of politics and stuff, so I sort of knew what was going on and there was a lot of publicity, long tan had happened, so everything could build up to that moment, so to speak. And I, being brought up in a military family, I had respect for what the VC is. You would have read your father's citation. Yes, numerous times, yes. If I was a son, at that moment when your father basically decides that he's going to stay and he's going to look after his mate rather than retreat. Well, that's an interesting question because um, if you have read the citation, Swatton, who Dad tried to save, actually got shot trying to save the South Vietnamese boat. So he did the same act, Dad tried to save him. And when you meet a lot of these people, Keith, who I know well, and actual VC recipients, it's a thing of mateship, family, and it's the training that comes in. Most of these people I've met who have done these heroic things, they're all concerned that there was someone else they could have saved. What? I don't know what Dad made that decision, and that's the decision he made. I love the fact that you've got these incredible medals um, honouring yep. your father. Will you wear those on Anzac Day? Yes, yes. I'd like to thank um, Michael, because he did these ones for me. Oh, from my mother, actually. So. Michael's a ridiculously skilled fellow. Not only does yes. he write brilliant books about Victoria Crosses, he also does this presentation of medals, uh, which is just extraordinary. I think uh, he even managed to get Keith's rack into a reasonable size. Size, yes. <laughs> Normally they're a lot bigger. Yes. <laughs> so, George, I'd like you to go across to uh, George Petru, and he's got a he's got something he'd like to show you as well. That's fantastic. Yeah. Excuse my eyes, it does. Got the larrikin side of Dad and a nice, nice face, nice eyes. Yeah. It's a great photo. It is. Was he a larrikin, your dad? Uh, he certainly was. I think most people in the services are, but when they get a bit more of a reputation, they, um, Keith was a larrikin, Keith still is a larrikin. But um, he was. There's a lot of tall tales and a lot of rubbish tales, but yeah, he certainly was. Right. Well, I'll, I'll just get, uh, maybe if you can come off the stage now. Thank you, George. And George, if you could return. Actually, I've just got to figure out, I've got to check my schedule and figure out what's next. But thank you very much to George Weekly. What I... Th I think what will get uh, to happen now is we'll keep Keith on stage, but I think we'll get all of you gentlemen now to leave the stage. And um, 
I then would like uh, Keith, this is the formal launch of the book. So maybe if we um, keep Michael on stage as well, do you think? <laughs> might, might be a good idea. You stay here, mate. You stay here, Keith. Um, you're going to help us. I'm just saying goodbye to <laughs> So this is the moment that I think we've all been waiting for. This is the launch of the book. Keith's going to help us with the unveiling. I'll give you one of these too, Keith. You, Keith's going to sing for us. Um, <laughs> um, it's a big moment, so I'll let you, I'll let you drive it, Michael. Um, give, us a, give us a bit of a, a sense of what it's been like for you to write this book, to meet all of these families and all of these VC recipients? Uh, it's hard to put that into words. It's been um, the highlight of my life, that's for sure. Uh, I've made lifelong friends through this. Um, I've experienced things that I didn't dream I would ever possibly experience. Um, I just feel lucky, uh, humbled, and frankly terrified that you're all going to read it and not like it. <laughs> Okay, well, without further ado, let's, let's, let's get it done. We've got copies of the books here. Would you like to lead the way, Keith, and we'll do an unveiling? I'll let you do the driving. I don't way. know if there's any right or wrong way to do this, Keith. So, over here, mate. So, this is the book. So, you want to say anything, mate? Do you want to say anything? Hey, mate. Yeah. Me? Uh, I, I, yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. I thought he might. In, in the uh, process of uh, the compiling of the book, I did ask Michael, uh, would, he, would it be okay if I had copy number one and copy number two? Number one, I would take to... Eng or no, well, both copies, England, uh, early next month. One copy will go to Her Majesty the Queen. The second copy will go to Prince Charles, who is the Queen, is the patron of our Vic Victoria Cross and George Cross Association, and Prince Charles is our president. So I did ask Michael about those, so, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> okay, All here's right. the big moment. We, let's do it. Go for it, Keith. You set? Chippy. And I think we've got it open over here as well. As oh, do I? <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, here we go. Oh, who's that fellow? That's <laughs> 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 beautiful. Uh, uh, the page is um, respectfully open to uh, William Simons, VC. Uh, his granddaughter is here today. She came all the way from London. Yes. Uh, so it was quite deliberate. Yeah. That's lovely. That's lovely. So listen, I'll get both of you gentlemen maybe to sit down. I've got a few more uh, closing remarks I've got to offer you. The book... The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers is now available for purchase outside. There are multiple bookselling tables to assist with this, including a, a limited set of collectible postcards that have been produced by George Petru. The author, Michael Madden, and the VC recipient, Keith Payne, and Doug Baird will all be available outside for book signings. Now, for the families of Victoria Cross recipients, this is a very important photograph. We would like to have a group family photo taken immediately after you leave the theatre and to assemble in the plaza just outside on the concrete forecourt area. It'll only take a moment and it'll be something that may never happen again. 
and could we please ask that you immediately go there on leaving the theatre so that you can be part of this extraordinary and historic opportunity. There are some light refreshments in the function room, which is further around this beautiful complex, where the Victoria Cross and portraits will be displayed, and those with VIP guest and interpasses are invited to this. However, please consider the space, as it's very limited, and we have quite a few hundred people already in here. A massive thank you for everyone attending, and we hope you've enjoyed the official launch of the Victoria Cross, Australia Remembers. It would be lovely to be able to individually thank everybody who's contributed to this book, but you know who you are, and it's been very special that you've made the contributions that you have. But we would particularly like to extend a huge thank you to all of the families for coming today, and the Victoria Cross recipients who are here today, and uh, we would like to extend congratulations to Michael and Gordon and everybody involved in the making of this book from TPI Victoria for being part of a piece of history. Now there's uh, a video that we're about to show you, which is a closing video, and then I'll speak briefly once again where the, um, the uh, Victoria Cross will be escorted out of the theatre uh, and uh, taken to the function room where you will be welcome to take photographs. I must say, I think it's quite extraordinary that uh, Bob Ratty uh, is allowing you, and indeed me, I just held a Victoria Cross in my hands this afternoon, and it's quite something, it's a big moment. So I hope all of you avail yourself of that opportunity. It's a very generous thing that Bob has done. But uh, thank you, and I hope you've had a good day, and I, I hope you enjoy Michael's wonderful book.
each other's shoulder Still so young but somehow so much older How can I go home and not get blown away? Ain't nobody gonna steal this heart away Ain't nobody gonna steal this heart away When the war is over, got to start again back then You and I we sent each other stories Just a page I'm lost in all its glory How can I go home and not get on away You and I had our sights set on something Hope this doesn't Wasn't that lovely? <laughs> I'd now like to ask Mr. Gordon Trail, who's the official photographer for the Victoria Cross, Australia Remembers, and cadets from the Army, Navy and Air Force to collect the Ratty VC and to escort it to the function rooms where guests are now welcome to take photographs and to be accompanied by a very burly security guard as well. <laughs> Thank you once again, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed yourself.